Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. My name is Patricia Fortley. I am a historian and former archivist from the University of Dundee. Um, I'm delighted to be here and I want to thank um, Daisy and the college for the invitation. So I'm going to talk today about the role of the poor law in the development of medical services in the Highlands and how that impacted on the general practitioners in those remote areas. The characteristics of the poor law, which of course applied throughout Scotland, had greater implications in the Highlands, particularly in relation to the provision of medical care. And of course, um, this presentation is part of a wider study I did, doctoral research on the development of medical services and the Highlands Downs Medical Service, which I will mention briefly at the end, but that's a whole different, um, a different presentation. So, I will just try and get my slides to work. Okay. So, so the key factor of the Scottish poor law which influenced medical care was the lack of poor relief for the able-bodied. The provision of medical services for the registered poor was therefore a key function and role of the poor law. In towns and other populous areas in the south, the provision of medical services to the poor was less problematic, but the remote and isolated locations of the highlands presented major difficulties in enacting the provisions of the poor law and later the requirements of the National Insurance Act. So things were very different in the Highlands. The first poor law medical service in Scotland was established following the form of the old poor law, which took place from 1843 to 1845. Within the Highlands and Islands, the poor law was distinctive in providing in many districts through the poor law medical officer, what was often the only source of medical provision to the general population. And it was within this context of reliance on the poor law medical service that medical practitioners worked in the Highlands and Islands in this period. The new act brought in two major developments which changed the public face of the poor law in Scotland. They were the establishment of a central authority, the Board of Supervision, and the transfer of responsibility for the registered poor from the Church of Scotland to parochial boards which came under the authority of the newly established Board of Supervision. The right to to build poor houses, including combination poor houses, was also part of the new Act. Although the Board of Supervision had centralised control over the distribution of the Medical Relief Act, which was established in 1848 to encourage and give some grants for councils to employ medical officers, at a local level, considerable power was vested in the parochial boards and they had the power to raise funds by assessment, so by the rates. This then became an annual charge and was a double-edged sword given the financial difficulties some parishes faced. And of course you have to remember that at this period in the Highlands we are, um, the famine is shortly to hit, we're in the middle of the clearances and um, it's a difficult time um, in the Highlands generally. The ability to raise funds annually by assessment represented the prospect of increased income to the parochial board, but placed a greater financial burden on the parish parishioners and the heritors, the local landowners. It also placed a great deal of power in the parochial boards and led to local tensions in some areas. Despite the administrative changes outlined above, the New Poor Law Act was criticised for not fundamentally changing the existing system of poor relief. The principal evidence of conformity to the existing status quo was that no attempt was made to extend those eligible for poor relief, either in the form of medical care or financial assistance. The decision to leave the supply of medical relief to the parish, each of which was empowered to adopt their own scheme of relief, because it was considered what worked well in one parish might not have been suited to another. 
and that led to the salaries of medical officers being fixed at a lower rate than was adequate for the services they provided. In Highland parishes, where doctors' remuneration was already vulnerable to non-payment by the able-bodied poor, the new legislation did not offer any immediate improvement. And um, later on, I'll say a bit about um, Paulton Allison, a very prominent um, physician who argued that the able-bodied impoverished should be allowed poor relief in the new poor law, but he did not win that argument. Despite these problems though, for the first time, provisions had been made for medical relief to paupers, the cost to be a charge on the poorest fund. Parishes were required to fund medicines, medical attendance, a nutritious diet, and clothing for the sick poor. Parochial boards could also subscribe to charitable medical institutions out of their funds. Of particular relevance to the Highlands, the extent of outdoor aid was not specified in the 19th century. It was given to be given in such a manner, and I'm quoting, uh, you can see it on the screen there, in such a manner as might be found practical and might be considered most expedient and equitable in the circumstances of each parish. So you can see there how the parish councils would have a great deal of power in this area. Parishes, however, were not obliged to appoint a parish medical officer for the registered poor. And the proportion of parishes providing medical relief in the Highland regions was exceptionally low. Some parishes in the Shetland Isles and on Skye provided no medical relief at all. And in the Northwest and Highland and Renesher, 35% of parishes provided medical relief only through subscription to a hospital dispensary. In the remaining crofting counties, no more than 19% of parishes in each county provided medical relief by doctor or dispensary. So that's a tremendous number of parishes that are, have no medical relief at all. And if you can imagine being very ill, having no doctor, possibly no nurse, very few trained nurses at that time. In fact, probably none. So those difficulties were not only in the Highlands, in 1904, 360 of the 880 Scottish parishes still had either no charge for medical relief or an annual expenditure of less than five pound. So that meant that the doctor was being paid five pound for his role as Pula medical officer. He may have other roles. He may have roles later as vaccinator or um, um, providing medicines, for example. He may also have a private practice but the private practices did not bring in a lot of money in some areas, in these remote areas, because people just couldn't afford the fees. So, this is the second report of the Board of Supervision. So this is not um, two years after the Board started, the reports were, were not done um, so quickly, but certainly in the 18, after 1845, before 1850. And this is a quote. So it shows that some progress had been made, but in many parishes, there were still very few doctors. Um, no medical, resident medical practitioners, and therefore those covered under the Poor Law Act, which meant that they were entitled to medical, those, those registered paupers were entitled to medical assistance and they couldn't get it. So um, that was a position just after the poor loss, the new poor loss started. So I'm going to say a little bit about the physician's inquiry, which is a good um, way to grade what had happened in the initial years after the new poor law. And of course now um, the new website, um, which has been developed by Daisy and her colleagues is up. And it's an excellent resource. It's a wonderful collection, really unique, dreadful handwriting, um, written by ministers, not by, not by doctors. But um, this is a wonderful way to interrogate what was happening in the Highlands at this time. So, five years later, after the new poor law, the Physicians' Inquiry was established to determine the extent of medical provision in the Highlands and Islands. 
The investigation collected evidence from established and free church ministers throughout the Highlands. 320 questionnaires were sent to ministers in 170 parishes of Argyll, Butte, Inverness, Ross, Sutherland, Caithness, Orkney and Shetland. They requested, the questionnaires requested details of the numbers of medical men and the areas covered by their practices. They also asked for the impact of the absence of medical assistance and what alternative sources of medical care were there. So, for example, quack doctors, um, herbal cures, traditional, traditional medicine. A high rate of returns was received, a very high rate of returns actually, 200 responses from 155 parishes. Within those parishes, 62 were adequately supplied with medical officers, 71 partially supplied, and 41 rarely, if ever, visited by any regular doctor. The latter destitute parishes, as they were called, so those which very seldom had a doctor, destitute parishes, as they were described in the report, contained an, a total population of nearly 34,500 people. So those people very seldom ever saw a doctor. So they would be reliant on quack doctors, on local women, um, Howdy's example, um, for maternity care. Um, a really dreadful situation for them to be in, and this is mid, mid 19th century. And those parishes are situated mainly in Ross, in Sutherland and in the islands. The partially supplied parishes contained 71 doctors and reported, and I quote, much suffering from accidental injuries that might be remedied were proper help at hand. The committee, which included William Pulteney Allison, who I mentioned earlier, and he was an extremely experienced and prominent physician and social reformer. He was also the former president of the, the college, the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh. He was concerned not to alienate any of the doctors with any implied criticism of their practice in the Highland parishes. And a second questionnaire was sent to the 71 medical practitioners identified by the ministers. Information was requested on the amount of work carried out, the level of payments received, whether they had any hope of amelioration of their, con of their conditions by any general measure or enactment. And that's a quote. The ensuing report indicated that the new poor law had not significantly altered conditions in the Highlands. The resulting data confirmed the, the continuing paucity of medical provision in the remoter areas and the onerous conditions under which doctors had to work. So there was very little medical provision and that which was undertaken was undertaken under extremely difficult circumstances. So doctors had very arduous journeys of many hours, sometimes lasting days, and they were undertaken by the doctors trying to reach payments, patients, sorry. All conceivable means of transport um, were utilised, boat, bicycle, horseback and foot over moor, mountain and sea, and with no guarantee that a fee would be paid when they got there. Salaries were modest, irregular and insecure. One doctor reported that from a population of 5,000, he could expect no more than £5 annually from private practice. So again, £5. Many of them were paid £5. A surgeon in the Hebrides summarised evocatively the impact of the lack of remuneration on his life and in the final sentence invokes the strong sense of professional and um, geographic, I think, hopefully we're on the right slide, and the strong sense of professional and geographic isolation experienced in those areas. And I think that's the right one there. So this doctor is saying he earns very little. He has 10 of a family. He can't take out insurance, he can't um, even keep up with the latest medical developments. 
and he can scarcely afford to give his family um, any education. He has islands to visit, which meant that he has to go find boats to take him. Um, he may encounter a storm and be stuck on an island for days. So he's saying, I wish you would send a qualified person amongst us to certain by personal observation our localities and superhuman labor attendant on our professional avocations. He is asking for the physicians, vision to query to send someone from, um, someone who can make an impact in the policy and improve things. This testament to money will almost certainly have paralleled the existence of many other doctors in the remote islands. For example, Dr. Wood from Sandy in Orkney stated, when called to neighboring islands, he was exposed to some such storm as, as to endanger my life and after visiting the patients, frequently return home without receiving any remuneration. So that was a very common occurrence that doctors simply would not get paid. The Small Isles reported that they had no doctor for seven years and were 10 miles from the mainland in any medical assistance. So can you imagine having appendicitis, being very ill and having no doctor that you can call on? That's the position these people were in all over the Highlands. In addition to the lack of remuneration, the most general grievances reported included the long dangerous journeys to visit patients and the lack of suitable accommodation. The report also detailed the nature and scale of unqualified, un unqualified practitioners and untrained midwives who provided medical aid in the Highlands. Some remote areas relied solely on midwives and some parishes did not have one at all. It's recent research has shown that the local women, um, the skilly wives, skilly wives that are called, howdies, um, that recent um, research has shown that actually these women were perhaps more um, skilled, having through the generations learned a lot, as than was previously thought, but clearly they were no match for a properly qualified midwife. In addition to the lack of remuneration, the most general grievances reported included the very long dangerous journeys to visit patients and the lack of accommodation. Um, oh, sorry, I think I'm just repeating. Anyway, never mind. Um, so unqualified practitioners are a real problem because those unqualified practitioners would bring um, fake drugs. Um, they would gather people together, they would um, get money out of these people, and these people have a subsistence, the majority have a subsistence lifestyle, so they didn't have much cash. And these um, fake practitioners were coming and taking some of that from them and giving them medic medicine that they actually couldn't use. So in some districts, doctors were forced to compete with, with um, these unqualified practitioners. They had no way of getting rid of them. Um, sometimes giving their services free to help establish themselves in the community. Instances of neighbours suggesting treatment for the sick were also documented. Parochial boards appeared content to, content to devolve responsibility to private charity. Local landowners provided relief in a number of ways by subsidising doctors' salaries, providing nurses and issuing medicines. The proprietors of Kinloch Ranach, for example, have contributed to a private fund which funded the employment of a doctor. And many landowners did that. Now remember, this is during the clearances, so landowners have lots of stresses on them. Um, lack of a cash income. And there are lots of issues about the clearances, but it's important to remember that some landowners try very hard to look after their tenants. Um, the wives of landowners were very important and usually were involved in philanthropic activities. So they would help often to provide a nurse, help the training of a nurse, and generally provide a really important um, aspect to, to the lives of these people. And during the famine, they were, they were 
key in providing much of the philanthropic support and organising philanthropic support to the Highlands, which is why there were no deaths from famine in the Highlands, unlike Ireland, where over a million died, or very few deaths. So the parallels of the physician's inquiry with the findings of the Dura Medical Service inquiry in 1912 are striking and demonstrate the slow pace of progress during the 19th century in supplying outlying communities with qualified medical attendants and in providing doctors with reasonable working conditions and salary. With prescient foresight, one minister's response to the inquiry called for, and I quote, a grant of money sufficient to give salaries to medical practitioners locating themselves in the districts now destitute. And that is exactly what the Highlands and Islands Medical Service did when it started in 1913. Slow progress during the next decades was made and by 1880, only six Highland parishes did not employ a doctor. Now that's not to say the quality of the doctors were, were great, but there were doctors there. Sandwick, Walls and Yale in Shetland, the islands of Colonsay and Gia in Argyll and the small isles in Invernessia. They were the only ones that did not have a doctor. Other seven and other seven parishes did not comply with the terms of the medical relief grant or were paid by fees only. So they had to comply, they had to pay a certain level to be able to participate in the medical relief grant. If they paid lower than that, they weren't entitled to a grant. So just a point of the 18, eight, there's about 880 parishes, there were 880 parishes in Scotland and 100, about 160 of those were in the Highlands, and that's roughly 19% of the parishes, and that includes Highland Perthshire. So quite a small number of the parishes were, were in the Highlands of the whole of Scotland. And of course, conditions in the towns were very different. They had their own problems after industrialization with increasing sickness and um, population increase, but the conditions were, the conditions were different in the Highlands, mainly remoteness, isolation, distance. The numbers of doctors, therefore, had increased from mid-century and in contrast to the findings of the physician's inquiry, all Highland counties then employed a doctor under the poor law in the majority of their parishes. However, although the poor law medical service did facilitate the provision of medical care to the general public, Poor conditions of practice, including income, tenure, and accommodation still persisted. As doctors often did not receive fees, they were essentially subsidizing the medical service. Those issues relating to the working life of Highland practitioners survived well into the 20th century. And even at the time of the Dewar inquiry, some of these conditions were still in parts of the Highlands, so it survived well into the 20th century. These included low salaries, the necessity in most areas to supplement income from private practice, and the difficulty many patients had in affording doctors' fees. Lack of security of tenure, availability of housing for doctors and nurses, arduous working conditions and professional isolation were the doctors' lot in the Highlands in many of the remote areas. The difficulties of saving for retirement was another very pressing concern. The conditions of service influenced the numbers of general practitioners prepared to move to the Highlands to work there. And for those who did, the reward could be penury in, a, in old age. Superannuation like holiday entitlement was not provided to the Highland doctor. By 1912, the overall, so this is 60 years after the poor law, the new poor law, roughly six years after the, the New Poor Law Act. The overall level of Highland medical provision was fragmented and tenuous and problems related to the appointment of medical personnel such as inadequate housing, insecurity of tenure, isolation and low incomes remained prevalent. Medical provision for the majority of the Highland population was totally reliant on doctors employed to carry out parochial medical relief. For those living in isolated districts, the cost was expensive and sometimes prohibitive. There was also a large proportion of uncertified deaths, up to 80% in some Highland areas, which bears 
this out and indicates an unwillingness to call the doctor, not necessarily through any mistrust of the medical profession, but through an, ability, an inability to pay. If someone had died in the road, um, the cost of a doctor, bringing a doctor to an outlying area, which could be as much as 15 pounds, for someone who's already dead would just not be done. So um, it, was, it was a way of a survival strategy for those people. While communications and transport improvements made it easier for doctors to carry out their work, in 1912, the Highlands and Isles Medical Service Committee, known as the Dewar Committee, found that doctors still gave their services when they knew that payment was unlikely. The continuing poor working conditions of doctors had not gone unnoticed. And in 1909, the British Medical Journal reported, and I quote here, the truth is there is something altogether rotten in the present system of providing for the medical and surgical attendants in certain congested districts of the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. This statement was in a letter by a doctor who had 40 years experience of working, as he put it, in the miserable conditions of medical relief in the Highlands. Two years later, in 1911, the Highlands and Islands Medical Service Committee was established under the chairmanship of Sir John Dewar, MP for Invernessshire, and it became known as the Dewar Commission, the Dewar Committee. He um, was also the whisky from the whisky company, Dewar's Whisky, with a house in um, Perthshire, just south of Perth. So the Dewar Committee, um, which comprised people who were extremely knowledgeable about, there were physicians, there were people from the island, the chief inspector of school, schools, um, the Marchioness of Tully Barden, very enlightened woman, Catherine, the, um, to be the Duchess of Athol, um, were there, and you can see the list of them there, um, Leslie Mackenzie, um, Beaton was the, the secretary, um, Dr. McVeil. So really big names in this. L.J. Robertson was the chief inspector of schools. Miss Tolmy, we think, was an admin person because there's no mention of her, who she is. So this was a distinguished, a distinguished committee, all with experience of the Highlands or of things like the Poor Law Commission, like the um, local government board. So they were, they were excellent, excellent choices. They set about in, 2000, in 1913, in 1912, sorry, they set about um, visiting the Highlands, they set out questionnaires, they visited the Highlands. Um, they had tremendous problems with the Scottish, with the Treasury in London, who didn't understand why they had to hire a boat, for example, to get to the Highlands. Um, they quibbled about the cost of the train to Inverness um, and generally didn't understand conditions in the Highlands at all. But the committee examined very thoroughly, very thoroughly the conditions in the Highlands and Islands. And they looked at the social and economic conditions, the nature, scope and quality of medical services in the Highlands and Islands, but also it's like a snapshot, it's a fantastic source, it's like a snapshot of the Highlands in 1912 and 1913. Um, an excellent, excellent um, source for historical research. And they concluded that medical services were inadequate, poorly funded, and that any improvement of the existing level of service could only be brought about by a substantial government subsidy. Now, this is not the first time a substantial government subsidy had been suggested, but it's the first time they got close um, to it, it was taken seriously. It was clearly accepted that medical practice for the general population of the Highlands and Islands was largely reliant on the poor law medical service, but also that the income and living conditions of doctors, such as housing and travel, required for no relation either to the work performed or the responsibility involved. Doctors were reluctant to take up posts in some areas or maintain remain in employment in the Highlands. The Medical Officer of Health for Sutherland reported in 1912 that there was also a perception that older doctors simply bedded down 
and could not provide a professional service. He had not benefited from modern medical training and opportunities for continuing professional development, which were of course more readily available in the more populous South. They were, it was not possible for rural doctors, having rural doctors due to the lack of holidays or locum cover. It was considered that less effective doctors would simply seek job security and a salary without the quantity of patients that would be experienced in the Southern urban centers. And this is a quote, you don't want the riffraff of the, the, of the profession to go to these outlying places. It is there that the better men are required. Leaving the Highlands was actively encouraged by the British Medical Association, who ran counter adverts in the press to discourage doctors taking up certain posts in the Highlands. So the, medical, the, the British Medical Association, um, word of mouth meant it was very difficult sometimes to, to find um, people to work in the Highlands. In some areas, however, local conditions such as a lack of a doctor's house prevented any continuity of service and led to a pragmatic approach of securing a doctor. In such cases, any doctor, regardless of level of experience or type of qualification was sought. For example, the parish of Vide in Orkney experienced six appointments between 1896 and 1903. So in seven years, there were six appointments. Women graduates, who found employment opportunities more difficult than male graduates to secure and who sought experience in domiciliary practice were employed by a number of Highland Parish Councils. Papa Westry in Orkney employed a succession of women doctors who were perceived as being more willing than men to live in lodgings as a house was not available on the island. So whereas nurses would normally be happy to live in um, patient's house. Doctors were not keen, male doctors were not keen on that. When nursing became more sophisticated in nursing, the conclusion of the jury committee was that nursing was extremely important in the rural areas. So the highly trained nurses, the Queen's nurses, were the ones least happy, least happy to work in those areas, um, to, to live with a patient. The governed nurses, who had one or two years training, were normally girls from the islands, they would happily go and live with, with their patients. So there are all these issues in securing medical provision for the Highlands. In 1925, the Parish Council of Papal Westry, and this is um, one of the most northern islands in Orkney. Um, in 1925, the Parish Council were still fighting for a resident doctor in Papal Westry and were only successful in securing a doctor's house in 1928. Between 1900 and 1935, Orkney had an average of 22 doctors in the mainland and islands. So those doctors would have changed regularly due to the conditions. At the turn of the century, the level of income generated from the poor law varied widely from 10 to 20 percent up to 150 to 200 pounds. Sorry, 10 to 20 pounds or up to 150 to 200 pounds when subsidized by fees from private practice. So doctors could set up a private practice in addition to their parochial work. The Jurek inquiry expressed surprise at the level of doctor salaries. That the average income of the medical profession was low. Those who know the Highlands and Ireland's intimately were well aware but we were not prepared to hear that so many medical men were eking out a living and some of them trying to rear and educate families on incomes well below the limit of income tax. So that was the, the Jury Committee's response to that. In remoter areas, the parish salary often appeared large in relation to the number of paupers because providing a substantial salary was, sent, was necessary to obtain a resident doctor. For example, the amount spent on medical relief in the parish of Barvis on the Isle of Lewis in 1906 was £210, which represented 13.61% of poor relief expenditure. A year earlier, in 1905, the medical officer in Colonsay was employed ostensibly to treat eight paupers. 
And of course, Colonsay had been one of the islands which didn't have a resident doctor. So they had managed to get a doctor, but they had to pay for that. Where a need for greater medical provision existed without sufficient work for a doctor, the employment of a trained district nurse was an alternative. The nearest doctor residing on the neighbour island of Sandy um, was, was um, used by her. She would, call, she would call the doctor where there was maybe telegraph or a telephone, which was increasingly the case. And there's, in, there's interesting gender issues in this because First of all, the women doctors were considered acceptable, although it was thought that the conditions in the Highlands were not suitable for them, but because they had no alternative, women were accepted. But they were preferred in islands because it was felt they couldn't do the amount of travel that doctors, the male doctors would do. Equally, nursing was still considered a vacation. It was um, a subservient, profession to the medical profession. And yet the nurses in the Highlands had a massive amount of responsibility. They were working on their own, um, often with no doctor, no resident doctor, um, with a massive um, workload. And they survived and they also had extremely, extremely large areas to deal with. So as well as the difficulty of the relatively low salaries, parochial medical officers employed for the treatment of outdoor poor did not have security of tenure, which was a long-standing grievance, nor did they have any paid holiday provision. And Dr. Um, Dr. Onyell, Dr. Taylor Onyell, said that for 10 years he hadn't been able to have a holiday and much of that time he hadn't been able to visit a dentist because there was simply no way he could leave the island and go and have a holiday or go and have medical treatment himself. Whereas the county medical officer of health, the new, the poor house medical officer, the sanitary inspector and the inspector of the poor could be dismissed only by or with the sanction of the board of supervision and later the local government board, the parish council had absolute powers of dismissal over the parish medical officer. This power was used indiscriminately by some parish councils, a fact noted by the Dewar Committee. They cannot dismiss a poor inspector for any triviality. They can, dismiss, they can dismiss a medical officer at will. Doctors were also subject to bullying and faced dismissal for no recourse. If no reason was given for a dismissal, the doctor, doctors with no security of tenure had no right of appeal. In addition, private practice was a regularly reported bone of contention between doctors and parish councils. So you can see how difficult the, the lives of the doctors were. So that's the, that's the background that the Dewar Committee were investigating. So we've looked from the reform of the Poor Law Act, the Poor Law Medical Service development, the Physician's Inquiry, which um, showed how grave the situation was. Throughout the decades that followed from the rise of medical um, public health from the 1880s, and this is 1912, and this is um, what Dewar said, the Dewar report said. So they said that it is clear that having regard to the economic conditions prevailing in the Highlands and Islands, the extent to which the foregoing services are at present subsidised from imperial funds is quite inadequate. And that as local resources are in, many, are in many parishes already well nigh, if not wholly exhausted, any general amelioration of the existing medical service cannot be achieved without a further and more substantial subsidy. So it recommended that the additional grant, the additional imperial grant should help develop the medical and nursing services and their administration and to provide a more satisfactory financial basis for general medical practice. The improvements were also to incorporate nursing and hospital provision and a specialist service. Specialist services were virtually absent in the Highlands and Islands. Those considered to be of greatest importance were dentists and eye specialists for adults and school children. In addition, a pathology service was required to deal with infectious disease, including diphtheria, typhoid, and tuberculosis. In the treatment of infectious diseases, the ability to transfer patients to hospital was crucial 
Local authorities were required to provide ambulances for infectious diseases, but there was no statutory requirement for ordinary illness. Medical and surgical consultation in the Highlands was largely absent. So the Dure Committee, just to conclude, the Dure Committee was the first governmental body to suggest institutional change financed by public money to benefit the poorer but non-pauperised sections of the community in the Highlands. Within the context of neoliberalism and the National Insurance Act, the Dewar Commission radically and uniquely within the United Kingdom and further afield was responsible for the establishment of the Highlands and Islands Medical Service in 1913. And the Highlands and Islands Medical Service provided a medical service for all at a uniformly low fee. So it wasn't a free service. Much of what you'll read about it said it was a free service precursor to the National Health Service. Um, it wasn't free and it had a long way to go to become that. It was not, not until the 1940s that the Highlands Health Medical Service actually started to really bring improvements. It was stopped in its tracks with, of course, the onset of the war in 1914. By the end of the war in 1918, the funds had been the funds had been maintained, their grant of £40,000, but for those years, but of course, post-war inflation decimated what they were able to do. So although the structure of medical services in the Highlands had started to change, there was much to do for the Highlands now as medical service, but that is another topic altogether. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk backslash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.